Mahalo for lava. This is Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. I'm Susana Suiswiki. Coming up, Pacific leaders trickle into Rarotonga for the PIFS meeting. Also, we have to be a lot more active in expressing our needs. Special votes confirms there'll be no Pacifica MPs in the next New Zealand government. And also on the region's radar are the Pacific Games in Honiara. We'll have more. The countdown is now on until 18 Pacific leaders and high-level delegations from the US, China, France, the UK and many more descend on Rarotonga for the largest regional meeting of the year. Japan's Fukushima issue, the Gaza-Israel war and climate financing are expected to be key discussion points. Lydia Lewis joins me from Rarotonga. Kia ora na, Lydia. Preparations are well underway now. Are the Cook Islands ready? Almost. Children are preparing to perform. Mighty A are being made in great numbers. These are the green leafy net garlands. And while they look really simple, locals have told me that they're really special. They're planted from Mighty Vine on the outer islands and then transported here. So I have mine in the fridge to try and savour the hard work that those who made them did. And the leaders will be gifted one of these, no doubt, at some point. Now, was the massive seawall mural finished yet? Well, I drove past it uh, last night. This is the largest painted seawall of its kind in the South Pacific. It's incredible. It's 560 metres long. It tells the story of the 15 islands of the Cook Islands. And when I drove past it last night, there were two very tired-looking people painting it. I did want to stop and interview them, but I was en route to interview the Cook Islands Prime Minister, so maybe that's one for next week. (laughs) And I understand you have confirmation that some of the political heavyweights will be no-shows? That's right. I have confirmation from New Zealand's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade that incoming Prime Minister Christopher Luxon will not be travelling to Rarotonga for this 52nd Pacific Islands Forum Leaders' Summit. Work is underway to send the outgoing Deputy Prime Minister of the caretaker government, Carmel Sipuloni, accompanied by Jerry Brownlee from the incoming National Party. So Colin Tukui Tonga has already reacted to the news. He said on social media, this is not a good start for Luxon, who lacks gravitas, and there's a lot of work ahead for him. It's unclear who will be attending the forum for Australia with Prime Minister Anthony Albanese this weekend in Beijing. The first visit by an Australian leader to China in seven years. Now, of the island leaders, there is a possibility that the Prime Minister of Vanuatu, Charlotte Salwai, won't make it, given the rush in his country to deal with the recovery from Cyclone Lola. And the Ulu Otokelao Kelihiano Kalolo will not be attending due to domestic issues. Tokelao has associate member status at the forum. But nevertheless, the leaders are starting to arrive. Tonga's Prime Minister, who is also the next chair of the Pacific Islands Forum, is expected to arrive in Tonga Thursday, Cook Islands time. The newer delegation arrives on Saturday. And then the big old Fiji Airways flight is expected to arrive on Sunday night at midnight. And this is a charter flight. It's going to be packed with delegations from nine countries. And the flight has been put on to make it easier for the Melanesian and Micronesian countries. The Cook Islands Prime Minister Mark Brown is the host and chair of next week's Pacific Islands Forum Leaders Summit. Lydia Lewis asked him what the key issues were for the meeting. Well, of course, uh, the 2050 strategy for the Blue Pacific, which was adopted last year by leaders, uh, is now sets the template for how we move forward as a region. So the implementation plan is critical. Uh, we in the Cook Islands have already uh, looked at uh, putting in place some work plans to support the implementation plan. What we'll, is the implementation plan? Well, we'll be launching on Thursday of next week uh, the Pacific Partnerships for Prosperity. And this is an initiative that we've established here. Uh, it's essentially showing how we in the Pacific want to engage with our outside partners, our development partners, our dialogue partners, with private sector, with academia, with NGOs. We want to we want to part, partner with them, whatever the initiatives are, on an equal footing as partners. 
And what are the other key parts of that? Obviously, you've just said we want to be on an equal footing. Mm. Is another one having all of the, the leaders at the, the, the same table as well from the forum, which has been talked about a lot this year. What else is on that as well? I think healing the rift that we had coming into this year from the uh, as part of the Suva Agreement, that those are aspects that we will be uh, consolidating and confirming and how we're going to progress that and move things forward. Um, engagement with... with uh, with our dialogue partners, as I said, is a, is a critical part for us. We don't want to be a region that is told, this is what we're going to do for you. We want to be a region that is part of the engagement, that is part of the discussion. We want to let other countries know, we want to let our development partners know what our agenda is and how we want to engage with them. Those are going to be critical uh, talking points for us. Um, and on the dialogue partners front, Dr. Tess Newton Kane says that they can muddy the waters at PIF meetings. Do you agree with that? Well, I think it's important that we control the narrative as specific countries, as specific leaders. So it's important that we set the agenda uh, and that we set the talking, uh, the talking points. And if we do what we can control, um, you know, what other countries do, we have no control over. Uh, but as long as we are clear on what our agenda items are and what we want to discuss and how we want to approach our development priorities, those are going to be the important parts for us. Is the development partner mechanism under review at the moment? We're looking at how better we can engage with uh, development partners. Um, you know, uh, in, in the past, normally dialogue partners have come and made statements on the day that we engage with leaders. Uh, we'd like to see uh, a bit more work done in that area where... There is a lot of preparatory work beforehand. So when we do get to meet, uh, as I said, it's on the basis of what our development agenda items are uh, and we'd like to hear from dialogue partners how they can fit into our program. Will you support Sitiveni Rambuka's Ocean of Peace initiative? Well, we've always been adamant that our region should be regarded as a region of peace. I mean, that was the, uh, that was the, the seed for the Rarotonga Treaty in an era when um, nuclear proliferation was between the US and the Soviet states uh, really led to that. The name Pacific itself means peace. So we see ourselves as a region of peace. We've been used as a battleground of conflict in previous uh, conflicts between uh, superpowers that are not part of our region. Right now, though, the Pacific is finding its voice. It's finding its place. It is making a stand in what it believes. And we believe strongly that we should be a piece of uh, a region of not just peace, but a region of stability and a region of prosperity. Will you back it, Prime Minister? Oh, certainly. I think anything to do that declares our region as a region of peace to reinforce that message, uh, whether it be in a declaration as proposed by Prime Minister Rambuka, I think you will find unanimous support from all of the Pacific countries. And given the forum is advocating for ocean protection on many fronts, how <coughs> do you, as the chair of the forum, reconcile your stance in favour of seabed mining? Yes, well, we, uh, we consider ourselves as stewards of our ocean. The protection of our ocean is paramount. The issue of seabed minerals has now come to the fore, and some of our member countries in the Pacific, including the Cook Islands, have taken a stand to look at exploration of the potential of seabed minerals. But let's not forget the key uh, theme behind our exploration phase is the protection of our marine environment to ensure that before we take the next steps towards harvesting any of this mineral wealth, that it must be done in a way that ensures the protection of our oceans. All of us are unanimous in that particular stand. And right now, there is no mining taking place anywhere in the Pacific or the world for that region. Uh, we are very much focused on uh, gaining the knowledge and understanding to enable us to make the decision whether we do take the next step or whether we don't make the next step because it will be too environmentally damaging. Now, Baron Wanga, how can someone with such a reputation, such as Baron Wanga, be a candidate for the Secretary General role? Well, these are the outcomes of the Suva Agreement that were at the last uh, leaders' meeting. Uh, this has been accepted by leaders, uh, and this will be a matter for discussion by leaders at this conference that we'll be holding in the next week. So without wanting to, to preempt uh, what leaders' views will be, uh, I will await until we've had discussions uh, on progressing the Super Agreement terms and conditions, including uh, the appointment or the nomination of Baron Wanga, and see how that transpires. Now, Israel-Gaza conflict, mm. will that be on the agenda? I, I have no doubt that this will be on the agenda. Uh, Israel is a very special place for many of our Pacific Island countries. 
um, and it will be, I, I, I am fully mindful, will be a, a topic of discussion by leaders. Is it good enough that it was only New Zealand and Solomon <coughs> Islands that voted for the UN resolution? Well, again, this is a matter that leaders will discuss uh, in further detail. Um, Israel is a special place, as I've mentioned, for many of our Pacific Island countries, including the Cook Islands. Um, what Pacific countries uh, I know uh, that I've spoken to are mindful of is that they don't want to see unnecessary humanitarian uh, disasters occurring. They would like to see humanitarian aid uh, flowing to those most in need. A senior Pacific academic says Pacifica leaders and community members in New Zealand will need to speak up in order to be heard by the incoming New Zealand government. The final election results are in and National no longer has the numbers to govern alone with the ACT Party, meaning they'll need Winston Peters' New Zealand First Party to form a majority. The results also confirms there'll be no Pacific representation in the next government. National's Angie Nicholas, who hails from Rarotonga, had been leading in the Te Atatū seat before special votes were counted, but she lost it to Labour's Phil Twyford, who got 131 votes. Neva Chittick spoke with Auckland University's Associate Dean of Public Health, Sir Colin Tukuitonga, about the final results. Oh, somewhat uh, predictable, I suppose. I mean, uh, special votes has always tended to favour the left, so to speak, so... Not surprised that the national lost two seats and uh, pleasantly surprised Te Pāti Māori has picked up uh, more seats. Uh, but in terms of the Pacific uh, representation in the government, obviously it's a concern. We have no one and unlikely to have any ministerial uh, portfolios that um, uh, represent Pacific uh, people. So not very good, I have to say. Why is that representation at ministerial level so important? Oh, that's where the decisions are made about uh, budget for education or budget for health or particularly, um, uh, for example, uh, Pacific Health providers uh, would depend on a champion in Cabinet to argue their case for whatever it is, diabetes or children, uh, children's health. And it's not just health, it's also uh, education. It's so, so important to have a strong voice or voices uh, in Cabinet. And clearly there, there is unlikely to be a Pacific voice in the new government. Do you think that then it will encourage more Pacific grassroots whether it be community leaders or perhaps lobbying of the government to make sure Pacifica voices are still included in decision-making? Yes, totally. That's absolutely what needs to happen. We have to speak up. If no one is in cabinet to represent our interests, uh, community leaders, credible uh, Pacific leaders, community groups uh, need to speak up. They see something unacceptable Uh, They need to speak up and they need to lobby their local MPs. I guess the point is that uh, I think we did reasonably well with the Labour Greens uh, government. Uh, We had a deputy prime minister even. So uh, it does mean that we have to be a lot more active in expressing our needs, uh, absolutely. What were the biggest election issues for Pacifica in this particular election, do you think? Well, I thought it was unfortunate some of Seymour's rhetoric about blowing up uh, the Ministry of Pacific People and dis- disbanding the ministry and other ethnic-based ministries. I just thought he was uh, his uh, stuff was totally unhelpful and destructive. Uh, so one hopes that uh, uh, Chris uh, Luxon and the National Party would moderate some of that nonsense from uh, David Seymour. People say all sorts of things about Winston Peters. The fact is that Winston has a heart and an understanding of uh, Pacific people. He's he's very popular in the region, Winston Peters, and it's uh, something that I hope uh, would bring some common sense to the whole decision-making process of the new government. New Zealand clearly has a big part to play in the development and aid assistance uh, to the islands. I understand, for example, that uh, Chris Luxon is not going to the Pacific Island Forum, an important event. Uh, You know, our people uh, flow backwards and forwards, and we can't just look at what happens here in Aotearoa. We have to be aware 
and be thinking about what happens in the in the wider Pacific region as well. In just a little over a fortnight, Solomon Islands will welcome thousands of athletes from 24 Pacific countries for the 17th edition of the Pacific Games, with participating contingents, including Australia and New Zealand, going through their final team preparations. But in Honiara, there's a development that could rock the host nation's campaign at the Games. Elias Otora reports. Local athletes from 15 sports federations are crying foul over a lack of financial and administrative support for their preparations and wanting sports administrators and the National Olympic Committee of Solomon Islands, NOXI, to intervene on their behalf. Solomon Islands athlete Irowane Primson says the athletes have formed the Solomon Islands Athlete Solidarity Group to take their issues and concerns to the respective authorities, but so far have had no luck. That's what the, uh, the voice of athletes uh, here for, just to voice out the conscience of athletes to the uh, organizing committees to consider that. If there is an uh, uh, issue with the federation, then those organizations should uh, address that to the, to the national federation. But they all not working uh, uh, transparently with athletes, so that's why the athletes are raising up just to, to voice out that we should not entertain politics and corruption in sports. While the National Olympic Committee of Solomon Islands has not responded to questions sent to them, the in-depth Solomon's website has said a spokesperson for Noxie says the only arrangement they are aware of is the incentive the government will give to medal winners after the Games. Athletes have been victimized on their preparation, especially their welfare. Most athletes have been sacrificing and most potential athletes have been already gave up. Yeah, So they quit training, they quit coming to training throughout the year and some, some they just don't uh, put the efforts on training, so during the national trials for the selection, they are not making a good uh, qualification for the team. So the opening ceremony in Honiara will be on the 19th of November with 24 countries to participate in 24 different sporting codes. New Caledonia ruled the medal tally at the last edition of the tournament in Samoa in 2019, coming away with 76 gold, 55 silver and 51 bronze for a total haul of 182 medals. Papua New Guinea was second with 38 gold, 57 silver and 35 bronze, peeping host Samoa who also finished with 38 gold but only had 42 silver and 45 bronze. But there are strong indications they will be challenged at the podium by other Pacific teams in Honiara this month. In Vanuatu, the women's beach volleyball champions are leaving no stone unturned as they continue their preparations to defend the Pacific Games title won in 2019. Vanuatu Volleyball Federation President Debbie Masauvakalo told RNZ Pacific from Port Vila on Thursday the team is on track for their title defense with two overseas tournaments lined up. So on Monday, the 6th of November, our women's team will depart Port Vila and go to Brisbane and they will play next weekend on the 10th and the 11th of November in the Queensland State Tour at Sandstorm. And then our number one team will then fly on Monday the 13th to Thailand where they will play in an FIVB World Tour Challenger event. Meanwhile, Tonga is sending a big contingent to Honiara thanks to the financial support of the government of the day. Team Tonga's preparation has been boosted by a 600000 per annum funding from Government Tonga Association of Sports and National Olympic Committee. Tasanok has confirmed they are sending 329 athletes from 19 sports to the Games. For New Way, touch rugby and netball are making a comeback after long absences. Chef Demission, Sydney Louis told RNZ Pacific that they are taking touch rugby teams to the Games for the first time in 16 years and netball team after 20 years. Heavyweight boxer Dukan Tutakitoa Williams will lead the country's campaign and is one of the favorites for a medal following his bronze medal win at the 2022 Commonwealth Games in Birmingham, England. Meanwhile, tickets for the opening ceremony are the most purchased ticket type since going on sale last week. Ticketing revenue supervisor Mike Verseni says tickets for the opening and closing ceremonies are limited and he is urging people to buy them as soon as they can. The games will officially open on November 19th and close on December 2. 
A year 11 New Zealand students of Samoan heritage, Telesia Tanawai, won third place at the 16th Chinese Bridge, the world's largest Chinese language and general knowledge competition for secondary students. Ms. Tanawai was among 168 finalists who travelled to China for the final stage of the competition. A total of 45,000 students competed in preliminary competitions across the globe. Fina Funua spoke to Telesia Tanawai about her experience. What did this competition in- involve and how competitive was this competition? Yeah, it started off with 110 students. We ordered a speech, a talent, an exam, and we did like this kind of game show thing for the television. Yeah, it was a, a bunch of games in Chinese. And depending on our scores on all four, that would let us know if we'd make it to the next round. And so after the first round, 30 of us were in the next round. I think 80 people cut off, and then it went down to the top five. So I was very fortunate I made it to top five, and the top five um, people were a representative of each continent. So myself, I was a representative for Oceania. And it must have been a bit nerve-wracking. Or it bit. was definitely, yeah, it was definitely, it was very nerve-wracking. And it was a lot of work, it was a lot of memorizing, it was a lot of pressure, and it was all done in a very small amount of time. Like for the top five, we had to learn a speech in one night, and we had to memorize it and deliver it the next day. And then also, like, we performed, like, Chinese charades, and then there was rearranging sentences and, like, matching radicals, testing us on our knowledge for reading and also our general knowledge on Chinese culture. And then the last round, we all had to rehearse, rehearse, rehearse because we were delivering a play. And we had to learn our lines, and I got to perform a rap. It was a very tight space. It was, like, not that much time to cram all this information in our brains, and it was very intense. You said you, you performed a rap. Yeah. So you rapped in Mandarin. Yes, I did. What what did you rap about? Okay, okay. so the first round, because our talent show, for the first round, we all had to deliver the same speech and the same um, talent that we did in our own countries. So I did a rap by Miss by Bava, V-A-V-A. Um, she's a Chinese pop star, and it's called Wo De Xing Yi, called My New Swag. So that's what it was about. It was, it was about being, like, king and, like, about bringing her new clothes into stage. And so heaps of people loved that because it was, like, different and it was quite cool. People often complain about how difficult it is to speak Chinese. Mm-hmm. Is it a difficult language? It is really difficult. It really is. It's completely different to English. If you want to learn Chinese, you really need to be immersed in the Chinese-speaking environment. There's five different tones, and each tone makes the word a completely different meaning. And you definitely need to be in a Chinese-speaking environment to really master the language. And for a Pacific uh, Islander to get third place at at a competition (laughs) like that, it's a a bit of an inspiration to other Pacific (laughs) Islanders. Could you describe that feeling? I am so honored to represent the Pacific on a big stage like that. For a lot of the people there, they have never ever seen a Pacific Islander before. And so I I got to wear like a blue pulitasi on stage and a lot of people um, thought I reminded them of Moana, which was really cool. And a lot of people know like what Pacifica people look like now or like where we are on the map. And so it was just my honor to represent us It was definitely just magical being able to represent my people on stage and I'm just so proud, so honored to have been the face of the Pacific for for the the Chinese people there. And, you know, some of them would ask if I was Hawaiian or if I was Native American, Native Canadian. Um, So I'm just so blessed and so happy that I could represent my people. Yeah, I I remember hearing from um, some of my friends who studied in China They'd say um, that people would come up and take selfies with them. <laughs> uh, did that happen yeah. with you? That happened a lot, especially after my performance. Heaps of people, um, yes, yeah, so many people. They're so cute because we performed at a school. And so all of our audience were high, sh- high school students. And so a lot of them were my age, but they would come up and they'd be like, hi. I love you. Can I take so? And then, like, try and speak <laughs> English. Um, and heaps, because I wore glasses for my rap, you know? And so heaps of people wanted to wear my glasses. And then some people wanted to wear my ballet for the last performance. Like, yeah, heaps of people um, came and took photos and 
were they added my WeChat and stuff. It was really cute. Last question: Could you read out some of your rap? Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 <laughs> hey. Look at me, Tong Shana Shia, Jana Pasha, the Shiji Yame, Daba Ja. They can go change Jay's Tatajia, you do the Yajan, and I want no Sanja, my thing is I knew one true shit. If I didn't look at Wooden Kai, what's on life, put the ink and time and shush at the Zang Ai. If one of the horses and the bat is shin to so turn, the Li Ha Sing Ching, the Tashi Yoman, you want the Sing Yi, the Yen, the Sing Sing, she shun the Jing in the patient, I can't watch the Sing Sing, he called it Chimu, what the Chichi Dumber of Bomo Hongwa, or eighteen thousand to your food and the bat she's a man. Wow, that was amazing. I think I think you should start a career as a Chinese pop star. <laughs> That's Pacific Waves for today. To listen back, head over to rndi.com slash programs. We're also on Apple, Spotify and iHeartRadio podcasts. From myself and the RNZ Pacific team, to fast we four.